Chuck mentioned the last meeting that they met and we made a, a nice group photo. I know not everyone is here who is on this photo, but uh, our department head wants to use it for the spring newsletter of Arms and Armor. Cool. So if, if you all are okay with this to be in the newsletter, that will be otherwise just say no and I can put a little emoji over your head. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so today we're gonna have uh, the fourth. Let's go back. Accidentally pushed my phone. So we're gonna have the fourth installment of the Gokaden series. Uh, just to recapitulate what we did with the first three parts, what we covered. Uh, we, st we started with the Yamashiro tradition and what we got uh, so far, the first three parts was the Sanjo and Gojo schools, which are the earliest Yamashiro, the founding, uh, the, the founders of the, of the tradition itself. And then in the, in the second part, we started with the early Awataguchi school. And in the third part, we ended up with the later and more famous Awataguchi masters. So today, we're gonna arrive here at the Rice School. Uh, just to give you uh, like an overview again, how difficult it is actually to, to trace the, the origins back of those schools. We don't know for sure when the Sancho School started. It's always said with Munichika around 990 or 960. It's not clear. Then we do not know how the Sancho and Gocho schools transitioned into Abadaguchi. We all we, all we know is that the Abadaguchi school started around 1200-ish. And then the Rai school, we only can speculate that it started somewhere in the 1250s. And we also do not know how they were actually uh, connected. And it's always, you know, we are very, we are kind of uh, spoiled when it comes to Japanese swords because everything is written down, like from the Muromachi period onwards. We, we, know, we know a lot of genealogies, we know a lot of names, but, this thing is like 800 years ago, so it's only understandable that we do not know everything, like when every swordsmith was born and when he died. So we don't know, don't know much about what, how the rice school actually started. It's always said in the books, the founder was uh, this Smith, uh, Raiko Niyoshi, who is <coughs> just dated around the 1250s. And there's a few theories about the origins of the, origins of the rice school. So there's really not a, a, a solid work extent that can be attributed to this Raikou Niyoshi without certainty, uh, with, with certainty. There's a few mystery swords. There's this sword here. It's signed Kuniyoshi. And uh, <coughs> Homa said, yeah, it's certainly early Kyoto, but it's not Awadaguchi. So he says, maybe it's, maybe it's the Rai founder, Kuniyoshi. So that's all Koma was able to say. And as you can see here, the blade has a little Utsuri, but uh, the Utsuri is not like the Bisen, the flamboyant one. It's the one that's more like uh, darkish. It's called a Chifu Utsuri. And every time you hear Chifu, you have to think about something early, like Kobisen and early Yamashiro, there's Chifu Utsuri. So this has the blades and this was, uh, would not be the style for Awataguchi. And the signature is, I juxtaposed them here, that's the Awataguchi Kuniyoshi, and that's the mystery Kuniyoshi, and Homa is of course right. If you look at the signatures, they're not, not anywhere close. So we might, we might rule out, it's really not Awataguchi Kuniyoshi. There was an Enju Kuniyoshi, same name, but he was active a little later, and there was a Yamato Kuniyoshi who worked in a completely different style. So the blade is certainly early Yamashiro, and Homa said, yeah, possibly the Rai school founder. Uh, also, the difference, the Mr. Kuniyoshi that I've just shown, the workmanship, and Awadaguchi Kuniyoshi. It's like a whole different, it's a completely different style. So you can't confuse the two. But then there's another one. It has the same like Utsuri, as you can see here. It's a little bit similar Hamon. And also not, uh, the signature doesn't match Awadaguchi Awata Kuniyoshi. That they, might, they might be the second Rai Kuniyoshi that's out there, but it's still, it hasn't been resolved. Homer wrote about this in the 70s. So it's 50 years since, and no one has come forward and said that's definitely the Rai school founder. Also just the, the two mystery Rai Kuniyoshis uh, put next to each other, you can see this, 
similarities in style. You can see the sim Utsuri and the, the Harmon. So maybe that's the same maker, but we don't know for sure if it's the Rice Cool founder. And then we have only one Oshigata or a drawing of the of the supposed Rice Cool founder in the, the early uh, early Edo periods, but you know it doesn't tell us much. It's just a drawing of a tanto and the signature was just it's not rubbed off, it was drawn in with the ink. So it doesn't help us really any any further. And then we have this mystery dagger. It's famous for a hundred years and everyone has written about it. And the interesting thing is uh, it's signed Chin uh, Sama no Cho. This is an honorary title, Minamoto Kuni Yori. And it's dated 1186. So it's a, one of the earliest dated Japanese plates out there. And problem here is, this is where the first character Chin is supposed to be. You, it's so much uh, polished down, you can't even read anything anymore. And this Oshigata is already probably 80 years old so well, there's not much hope that anything could be revealed but there were several theories about this first character so uh, Chin is, a, is, a, is an ancient uh, last name that was coming from China to Japan similar pronunciation but then uh, Fukunaga Suiken who is one of the, the, the most uh, well respected experts in Japanese sorts so that's the Chin what is supposed to be there which is hardly visible anymore. But Fukunaga Suiken said, yeah, maybe it's actually not Chin, maybe it's Rai. It's a, it's a Korean last name. And there's this old tradition that the rice coal came from the Asian mainland. So Fukunaga said, maybe it's just the, the Korean name and that's the founder of the rice coal. But we don't know, it's too early for Rai. There is some remarks that, uh, that Kuni Yori was the ancestor of the Watakuchi school, but this cannot be confirmed either. So it's a big mystery plate. And the interesting thing is the name Rai, the character for Rai means to come. So to come to Japan could mean that they have been, you know, migrated to Japan and stayed there and became swordsmiths. But the first time any rice miss signed the character for Rai on a plate at all is was not before 1290. So there were like two generations before two generations of rice miss before anyone actually signed Rai. So another mystery we have to deal with. And the first who signed the Rai character was Kuritoshi. And it was as mentioned, it was 1289, 1290. That's the first time we see the Rai character on a plate. But we can come back to Kunitoshi shortly. I just wanted to mention him because there's a very, you know, very poetic uh, interpretation of why the character Rai came uh, to be used by the school. So one tradition says, Rai Kuridoshi, who was the first to sign it, he went on Mount Hiei on the north of Kyoto. He climbed up there and then he looked down on Lake Biwa and he thought uh, the sailing boats that were coming towards him, huh. they look like the character Rai. So that's like a fancy poetic uh, tradition. And that's why I thought, oh, maybe I use this as my school's name. But it's uh, the theory or the approach that doesn't hold really, because in the old, the old sort of documents, they already record the name Rai, even if it's not on plates. Because Rai Kuni Yoshi, the supposed founder we just have seen, his son Kuni Yuki, he is written down as uh, with the first name Rai Taro, which means basically the the eldest son of, of Rai. So Kuniyoshi was Rai and Rai Taro, his first son was Kuniyuki. And this is also when we do have plenty of plates. With Kuniyuki it starts, so many uh, count Kuniyuki as the de facto founder of the Rai school. And just to give you a few figures, oh, that's the same, the same with, the, with the names. So Kuniyuki is called the, the eldest son of Rai and Kuniyuki's Kuni son is called the grandson of Rai. So that keeps up, that, 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 uh, that holds that approach. So he was Rai Taro and his son was Rai Mago Taro, so the grandson of, of Rai. And Kuniyuki, now it gets really, it gets concrete. Kuniyuki, there's a lot of plates by him. Uh, he has 11 Chuyu Bichutsu Hin, 15 Chuyu Bunkasai, he has one Kokuho, he has almost 100 Chuyo, and he has 21 Tokubetsu Chuyo. It's nothing compared to his son Rai Kunitoshi, who has hundreds of Chuyo. 
there's so many Chuyu by Raikuni Doshi, but it was already a, a big, uh, you know, a, like a, a manufacturer. So all Kuni Doshi students made blades for him, for him, and there are so many around. You can go down to Times Square and find probably one. <laughs> <laughs> so Kuni Yuki already a hundred Chuyu. It's pretty good. And that's why he's considered as the de facto Rai founder. And I want to just want to introduce some works for you today about what we can expect to see workmanship-wise from Rai Kuniyuki. So it's interesting is we can trace we can trace his style a little bit chronologically. So he started in a very conservative style, and then he got more like Rai typical and mid Kamakura. So that's an early blade of his. It's Tokugetsu Chuyo. It's very elegant. You can see the elegant. Uh, style of the tang and I'm gonna show you an Oshigata and those who have been here for the last few uh, parts you will uh, immediately recognize there's a stylistic connection to the Abataguchi school please look at the hamon there is some layering going on above of the hamon there is some uh, the same approach we can see here for example I, I just juxtaposed them that's the Kuniyuki and that's Abatoguchi Kuniyoshi. So it's very, you can stylistically link them. It's the same, the same production site, about the same era. It's like a very <coughs> natural harmon and a lot of stuff going on above of the harmon. That's the early, the early Rai Kuniyuki. There's another one that's uh, in his uh, early, his conservative style. The, 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 the Kichimomo Tang the smallish tip but it's getting slightly larger and that's the Oshigata and this is interesting too we're gonna show you in a second there's also stuff going on above the Hamon but it's not that loose anymore it's it's like connected to the Habuchi it's more connected to the Habuchi and this you have to pay attention to these two elements to look like these little half moons those little things are called Karimata and Karimata is actually a, a type of an arrowhead that's this by this this this, this two-part arrowhead is called Karimata and those activities we have also seen at the Abadaguchi school at Kuneyasu so it's not that pronounced here but if you see like this this crescent shaped thing above the Hamon it's called Karimata and it's early Kyoto early Yamashiro style you can also find them on uh, uh, Ayano Kochi Saratoshi uh, but it didn't survive. So end of Kamakura, early Nambokcho, those elements they disappear. And then we're gonna uh, proceed uh, with uh, then Raikuni Yuki. His style changed. He got a little, he got a little more choji, a little more controlled. Uh, not these natural things. Uh, not that much going on above of the Hamon. So this is like lay, a little later in time that Kuni Yuki uh, uh, developed this style that was later taken over by his son. Rai Kunitoshi, whom we know two faces, Nichi Kunitoshi and Rai Kunitoshi, but it's going to be for the next chapter. So this Choji style is going to hand it, be handed down to his son Kunitoshi. And then uh, also the same Choji thing arranged as a Suguha. This is a, this blade is this, the, the, it's Kokuho, it's a national treasure sword by Rai Kuniyuki. That's the style on his head at the height of his career. It's mid Kamakura, the Kisaki is short, it tends to Ikubi. The blades are getting wide, they are very have a robust look. And that's like the height of Kuniyuki's, Kuniyuki's uh, career, that's his typical style. And that's, the, that's just a, a photograph of, this, of, the, of the national treasure, so you can see it not only in Ozik Oshigata, but in steel, that's his typical style. And what is very important by Rai Kuniyuki, what this, this distinguishes him and his school, if you look at the sore, the center of the, of the curvature is in the middle. So Rai school is known for Tori sore, and not the Koshi sore as the earlier blades where the, the center of the curvature is like down here. So already Rai Kuniyuki, he is known for the Tori sore, that's the, where they're uniformly curved blades. Here you have it, Tori sore. And then with Kuniyuki, we also have, we slowly start to have other blade types. So for example, this is a very early Uchi Katana. It's about 61 centimeters long. It's signed on the, on the side that you will wear it, you know, where it shows outside, the cutting edge up. It's a very early Uchi Katana by Rai uh, Kuniyuki. But it's the same style of the mid Kamakura. Robust shape, 
ikubikisaki. So for those uh, who don't know, ikubikisaki means uh, the boar's neck tip. It is when this part of the kisaki is shorter than this part. <coughs> Anyways, if you have the short kisaki, it's called ikubikisaki. It was mid Kamakura, it was 1250s, 60s, 70s, this type of. And then it, can, uh, it, it came out of fashion and then this kisaki gets smaller again. And then also we have we have exactly two tanto by Raikuni Yuki. That's one, it's Tokubetsu Chuyo. <coughs> it's it's white, it almost <coughs> looks like it almost looks like an Ambokchu style, but it's a there were a few smiths like also Wataguchi Yoshimits who made those styles in, in the Kamakura period. They would be an Oshigata. Uh, a little bit different than his uh, long swords, but you know, there are only two daggers left. You can't uh, draw that much information about his what is his typical Tanto style, because we only have two. And then I want to uh, tell, uh, I want to conclude by uh, an interesting piece by Kuniyuki. This is called the, the Meibu to the famous sword Fudo Kuniyuki. And Fudo is the deity, Fudo Myo is the engraving on the blade. And this blade was uh, owned by Hideyoshi. It came in the possession of the Tokugawa. And then in 1653, when Edo burned down in the Great Meiriki Fire, this got, uh, was damaged by fire, and Echizen Yasutsugu rehardened it. So the blade exists, it's in the Imperial collection today, it's Gyobutsu, and we have all the old Oshikata drawings by the Honami family before it burned down. So that's what we have, and the interesting thing is many smiths uh, tried to copy this blade. There was a whole tradition of just copying this blade. For example, uh, this, I just to show you the Horimono upright, so it's Fudo Myo and the, the Kurikara dragon over the sword. And uh, some of you might know the story in the like early 1700s when the sword, the craft of the sword was declining a little bit. There was one uh, Tokugawa shogun who wanted to change this. So he was inviting all the smiths around the country to uh, participate in the sword making contest. So they came to Edo, 1721 and four, there were four winners, and this is one of the winners. And he made this uh, ten, 10 years, about 10 years before the contest, and he already copied the Fudo Kuniyuki with the, the Horimono and the, the same type of groove and, and shape. And then when the contest came, he thought maybe I actually copy and make another copy and submit that, and that's why he won. He won the contest with three other smiths. So that's the one he won the contest with, is another Fudo Kuniyuki copy that he made 1721. And as you can see here, there's the single leaf of the Tokugawa crest, and he got this as a reward. And all the four winners got the permission to engrave one of the, the Tokugawa crests. But it's interesting that he picked to copy the Fudo Kuniyuki, which was then in the Tokugawa possession, but he was surely not having it in hand. So he was working off the old Honami drawing of the blade. But it remained to be a tradition to, to copy this blade. So for that's just to, to put it next to each other. That's the that's the drawing in the in the Kyoho Maybuts Cho, and that's the the winning sword of, of Shige Kane next to each other. It's pretty faithful what he did. That's how that's the drawing and that's the what uh, Shige Kane submitted for the Shige Kane for the contests. So he tried to stay as faithful as possible to recreate the Hamon. Uh, and there's another blade, another smith, early Edo. He also made a Fudo Kuniyuki copy and even <coughs> he, he wrote it down on the tank. So this is a Fudo Kuniyuki copy. So it's very interesting to see as many smiths try to copy this, this, this blade by Rai Kuniyuki. And that's an interesting blade because it's a blade is uh, made by Hisen Masahiro. It's dated 1672. And then 100, almost 130 <coughs> years later, someone wanted to have the Fudo Kuniyuki Horimono engraved on the blade. So he approached uh, Nobukuni Yoshinao and said, I have this old Hisen blade. Can you add the Horimono of the Fudo Kuniyuki? And he did so, and it's a Wakisashi. I think it's a Wakisashi. But it's interesting that the people are constantly thinking about this famous blade and had artists make copies or have the engravings added to this sword. So 
Today it was a very, a very brief overview. I wanted to just start with the how the race call, the race call originated. We don't know much, and everything starts with Kuniyuki. And next, in the next installment, we're gonna continue with uh, Kuniyuki's son, Rai Kunidoshi. And then we have like a, a ton of work to talk about. And then we'd, 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 we'd like to make another kante. You know, like the last time, we, uh, we split up in groups and and have a little Oshigata and then everyone can participate in the Kante. So we will go more into the workmanship next time. So I wanna end it here for today. So it's gonna be the last one for this year and it's gonna should be an easy one. And next year we're gonna start over with Raikuni Doshi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. what makes it special or what's the telltale signs about the Raihada? So mm -hmm. the Raihada is an interesting thing uh, because the, you know how the Japanese sword is constructed? You have a soft core and a, 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 a harder jacket and the Raihada, the Rai Smiths are supposed to, uh, they're allegedly used a very thin, uh, very thin jacket of the steel and when you polish down the steel, it gets, uh, it, it, either the core steel comes through or the, the less refined parts come through. So you have patches of steel that have like l lesser structure than the surrounding ones, lesser itame. So if you have like an itame and a super fine itame, almost no forging stru structure, you, you know, you say, you would say shingane showing through, but because it's so typical for the rice school, they call it rai harder. So it's, kind of a, a more positive term for a Shingane coming through or the steel is getting thinner. So that's, that's how they, they call it Rai Hada. So don't say, so don't say Shingane. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. Sure. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us about Nakajima Rai and how they're related? Uh, yeah, Nakajima Rai, it was uh, Rai, uh, was what a Kane? Mitsukane. I think Rai Mitsukane, he was the latest myth. Oh. He was like, oh, so Rai Kuritoshi, then Rai Kunimits, and then come Nakajima Rai. And it was a Rai Smith who just moved from Kyoto a little bit over to Osaka, Nakajima near Osaka. And that's why his school is referred to Nakajima Rai. He never signed with anything Nakajima, but they, he is called Nakajima Rai because he moved there. Okay, thank you. I'm it but with the, the, the Rai Hada, it's like similar with the Nie Utsuri. It's like all terms that were coined much later because no swordsmith said, oh, I'm gonna make Nio Tsuri today. They just <laughs> made Chinie, and if the Chinie has a certain form like a, and, and looks like, like Utsuri, then you call it Nio Tsuri. But it's not something someone made, uh, I'm gonna make Nio Tsuri. <clears throat> and the rice smiths didn't say, I wanna make Rai Hada so that everyone knows my plates. <laughs> Done. Thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you, Marcus. Thank, Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Okay, two things before.